Hi, good afternoon, everyone. What a great turnout. Okay, so uh, welcome to this afternoon's talk about test-driven development on the Android platform. Uh, my name is Jonathan Gerrish, and I'm part of the Mobile Ninjas, and we're a small team within Google who are passionate about software testing and code hygiene. And we work to build a series of tools and infrastructure to help developers uh, like you become more happy and productive. Uh, can I just get a quick show of hands out there? Who's writing tests right now as part of their normal software development practices? Okay, that's good to see. Okay, so everyone's telling you that you need to write tests, but why should you really do it? It's true that uh, writing tests is going to take time, and it's going to add uh, code weight to your code base. Um, perhaps you've been in a situation where you've had a manager or a client that's been telling you writing tests is slowing down your velocity. Well, we believe there's so many compelling reasons to write tests. Uh, tests are going to provide you that really fast feedback that uh, is going to catch a bug much earlier in the software development process where it's a lot easier to fix than it is after your application has shipped. So in software development exists the concept of a test pyramid. And uh, this pyramid is made up of a number of layers. And each one has its own strengths and drawbacks that need to be weighed uh, to form uh, a complete software, automated software uh, testing uh, system. So starting at the bottom layer, that's the, uh, the uh, realm of unit tests, uh, small tests. And these live in abundance. Uh, they need to be fast and highly focused. Um, that's why we recommend that you run these kind of tests as what is known as local unit tests. So they're going to run on your local developer's workstation rather than a device or an emulator. Um, the compromise that you're making with these kind of tests is that you're losing fidelity because you're probably going to be using a bunch of mocks and fakes, and it's running in a non-realistic environment. Now, as we move up the pyramid, we're into the realm of integration tests and end-to-end -end tests. And the idea with these kind of tests is bringing in more fidelity into your testing uh, scenarios. Uh, so it's going to be a more realistic environment and probably with some real production components. And that's why we recommend that these kind of tests are going to run on an emulator or a, little, or a local device. Uh, so these are, the actual, these are the tests that are going to give you the confidence that your app actually works. Um, however, they are less focused. So a failure in one may be a little harder to track down than it would be in the corresponding unit test. And of course, you're trading off execution speed. Um, you need to build and test, build and compile your uh, tests locally, package them, and ship them to a device for execution. So with test-driven development, the idea is to start by writing your tests first. And then you're going to write the code to satisfy those tests. And only once it's all green is it safe to submit your code. So another show of hands, how many in the audience are currently test driving their code right now or tried TDD in the past, perhaps? OK. Uh, so test-driven development, we, we love it in Mobile Ninjas. Um, we think that it forces you to think about your design, the structure, and the APIs inside your application up front. Um, it's also going to lead to less code because you're only actually writing the code necessary to satisfy the tests you've written. So this, this form of development allows you to release early and often. So once your tests are green, you can then deploy your application at a moment's notice. With test-driven development, the, like, the key mantra here is red, green, refactor. You're going to start with a failing test, implement the code to satisfy it, and then you're going to refactor your code and repeat that process as often as you need to get it just right. So how does this tie into the workflow and also tie into the Android ecosystem? So first of all, we start um, with a large outer iteration. And this is driven by uh, a UI test. This is actually going to drive the whole feature development. And then within that larger iteration, there's a series of smaller iterations. And these are concerned with uh, developing the units uh, required to satisfy that complete feature. And then at the end of that uh, large iteration, those completed units are assembled back together, making the, uh, the UI test now pass, and your feature should be complete. So let's take an example, a look at an example workflow um, in a sample notes-taking application. So the feature we're going to implement today uh, is the add note flow into our notes-taking application. You can see we start with the notes list screen, uh, shows some existing notes. There's a floating action button there, bottom right. 
the user can click that and it'll take them to the add note screen where they can enter a, a title and description of the note before clicking the save button. And they're returned once again to the notes list screen where they hopefully should see their new note show up. So coming back to our workflow for a second, the first step is to write that failing UI test. Let's see how it's done using the Espresso UI testing framework. Right, so the first step, again, is clicking on that floating action button in the corner. We're taken to the notes, uh, add note screen where the user will, will type in the, the text and the description. And then we're gonna click on the floating action button. And now we're returned to the notes list screen and here we can verify that the note we just add shows up, great. So remember that we're doing test-driven development and we're not gonna actually create any of the implementation code just yet. All we need to do is create enough of the application to allow us to run a test. So think about a skeleton activity and maybe just the resources we need to drive this test. Now at this point, we can run our test and we'll see it fail. So we just need to implement the feature. Okay, so applications are built up of many small units and they're highly specialized components, each with a specific responsibility. And collections of these small units are then like assembled together and their collaborations and interactions will implement the entire feature. Taking a moment to summarize the key characteristics of a good unit test. Well, as well as the normal conditions, we want to uh, cover all of the unexpected conditions. So, bad input values, the boundary conditions, the like. You're gonna write a lot of unit tests. Tests should also give you the same results every time. Don't depend on any external servers, uh, current time of date, anything that would introduce flakiness. Um, and avoid making assumptions about the underlying implementation of your code. Uh, you want to treat it as a black box so that changes to the implementation won't ever cause you to write, uh, change the tests. Uh, because we're writing so many tests, you're gonna need immediate feedback. Uh, tests should run really fast, and we don't want you to ever be discouraged from writing tests because, or refactoring your code because uh, the, the, uh, the test execution time is too slow. And finally, tests are an excellent source of documentation. Uh, Well-written tests will uh, serve as documentation that evolves as your code changes and don't become out of date like static documents. So let's write a test for the add note activity. Uh, remember its job is receiving user input. Uh, it's gonna persist it to local storage um, and it'll be implemented using an activity and uh, we'll save the data as into Android shared preferences. Looking at an idealized unit test, um, it's gonna have three key parts. Uh, first of all, setting up the conditions for the test. Uh, this is like creating the object under test, the dependencies, setting them up in the right state. Then we exercise the code under test. And then we're gonna make assertions on the results. And I like to clearly separate these uh, three sections to bring the pertinent items front and center to make for a really readable test. Let's see how that would look like uh, in RoboElectric. So RoboElectric is an Android unit testing framework that runs tests uh, as local unit tests. This means they're gonna be running on your local developer's workstation. Now, since most of the Android framework is written in Java, that means RoboElectric can run that Java code on your desktop. This means you're gonna have access to resources, views, and most of the Android APIs are gonna work just as you'd expect. RoboElectric provides some test doubles, which we call shadows. And these stand in for parts of the Android SDK, which uh, can't actually run on a developer's workstation, or maybe they're not appropriate for unit testing. So think about native code, interactions with the hardware, or any um, inter-process calls to system services. RoboElectric uh, initializes your application based on a manifest, and it wires everything together, setting up the activity, inflating the layout, and notice here that we're calling real Android uh, methods. This takes a second or two, so it's perfect for the red-green refactor cycle. Although RoboElectric allows you to call real Android APIs and run real Android code, um, it doesn't, Android itself doesn't provide testing APIs, and that's where RoboElectric shadows step in. So getting hold of a shadow is easy. You can call the shadow of method on any Android framework method, and that will quickly lead you to a bunch of testing APIs for stubbing the framework. At this point, we can run our test, see it fail, and uh, now we're ready for the easy part, which is implementing the code. I'll just leave that for your imagination. 
And once we see the test pass, we can refactor our code as often as necessary. I remember how we said our unit test should be thorough. Roboelectric's great for that. You can test all manner of conditions um, because the execution test is, uh, the execution uh, speed is very fast. You're free to write lots and lots of uh, cases. Roboelectric will also help various condition testing. So um, think about testing different uh, screen layouts and orientations or running on different versions of Android. We've also been working to reduce the developer friction uh, when using the official tool chain. So now starting with Android Studio 3, you can just add this snippet into your Gradle build file and uh, Roboelectric will just work out of the box. Uh, and Roboelectric's not a one-size-fits-all testing tool. It's fast but not 100% faithful to the behavior of a real device. So remember, it's just one tool in your testing toolbox. And now that we've got some passing unit tests, I'm gonna hand you over to Nick, uh, my colleague Nick, who'll talk to you about higher level testing. Thanks. Thank you, John. <clears throat> so let's go back to our developer workflow for, for a second. So at this point, hopefully you have a ton of unit tests that test all of your business logic. So let's switch gears a little bit and see how we can add some more integration tests to see how those, all those units integrate together and how we integrate with the Android platform itself by running in a real environment. As John, as John mentioned, these integration tests give us a lot of more fidelity, but they come with a cost. These tests are slower and are more flaky. Why is that? Well, if you go back to our example, one obvious difference between Rob Electric is that these tests run in a real environment using a real device in order to get this higher fidelity we talked about. So let's see what actually happens behind the hood when you click that Run button in Android Studio. The first thing that happens, Android Studio will install two APKs, the Test APK and the Android under Test APK, where the Test APK contains your Android unit runner, the test manifest, and the test cases. And then the next thing that Android Studio will do for you is it will actually run an AM instrument command, which will in turn make Android unit runner run all of your test cases against the Android app under test in the same process. So as you can imagine, this increases execution time, and at the same time, it increases the surface area for failures. In addition, when we run this continuously at Google across a billion test targets, we found some additional challenges. The first thing that we see is that there's a lot of shared state be between tests. And I'm not only talking about the shared state that you code in your app, I'm also talking about the shared state that builds up on a device, disk, uh, or memory, which can you know, cause some unpredictable failure. And among other things, you know, uh, this can potentially lead up to test crashes. And since in the previous model, everything runs in the same process, if one test crashes, it brings down your entire app process, and all the subsequent tests do not run anymore, which is really bad for a large test suite. And similarly, uh, for debugging, you can only imagine uh, how your lockout will look like when you're running thousands of tests in one invocation, and we need to debug through it to find the root of the problem. This is why at Google, we use the Android Test Orchestrator, where the Android Test Orchestrator is a separate service APK that runs in the background in a separate process, and is responsible to run each test in a single instrumentation invocation. And this obviously brings us a lot of benefits. First of all, there is no more shared state. Each test is in its own isolated invocation. Similarly, crashes are isolated, so one test uh, crash will not bring down the entire app, and all the subsequent tests will actually continue to run. And lastly, for debugging, all the info that you collect for tests can be now scoped to a specific test as opposed to the entire test suite. So this is great, and we benefit a lot from it at Google, and as part of our latest ATSL release, you can use it as well, so I encourage you to give it a try whenever you have a chance. Okay, so now that we know how we run our tests, let's see how we can actually write some good UI tests. So usually if you're writing UI tests, you're probably using Espresso testing framework. Uh, as you can see, Espresso was designed with simplicity in mind. It basically mimics what a user would do. Basically, you give us a view matcher, and then we find a view in a view hierarchy that matches that view matcher. When we have that view, we either perform a view action or check a view assertion. This makes it a great tool for TDD since writing tests and prototyping them becomes much easier. But in order to provide this simple API, we actually have to do a lot of work under the hood. So actually, let's dive deeper and see how Espresso actually works. 
When you give us a view matcher, the first thing that we do is we create a view interaction for you. The next thing is we're going to make sure that your app is in an idle and sane state before we actually do anything with your interaction. The way we do this is we loop the message queue until there is no more messages in the message queue for a reasonable amount of time. We then look at all of your idling resources that register with Espresso and make sure that they all report idle. Now, uh, the last thing that we do is we look at the async tasks and we make sure that there are no background work still running. If you think about this, this is basically the core of what made Espresso so awesome because it takes uh, care of all this synchronization for you. After we know and we're sure that your app is sane and an idle state, we move on to the next step. We then use the view matcher to traverse the view hierarchy to find the view that matches that matcher. And once we have the view, we're going to perform the view action or check the view assertion, and then we repeat that cycle. Okay, so now let's circle back to our original example to show you um, how everything ties together in code, right? So on this first line, we want to add, uh, click on the Add Node button. And we, for that, we use a simple view with ID view matcher to locate the button, and we use a simple act click action to actually do the click. So, so far, pretty simple. Now, on the next line is where it actually gets interesting. On this line, we want to type uh, the node title and description. But before we do that, Espresso synchronization will kick in and make sure that everything is idle before actually performing any of these actions, which is great because it eliminates any you know, artificial sleep in your code or any other boilerplate code to actually mimic this uh, behavior. Finally, following the same logic, we're going to click the Save button, and we're going to verify that your note is displayed on screen. Great. Now we know how Espresso works, and I showed you how to write your first integration UI test. Now let's see how we can improve our testing strategy even further. The first concept that I would like to introduce you to is that a good UI should never sleep. Let's go back to our original example so I can illustrate this point better. In this example, we have a simple implementation where we save our node into memory, which is fairly fast and pretty reliable. However, uh, in reality, as your app grows, you probably want to save this node to actually uh, extend this functionality to actually save the node to the cloud or to Google Drive. So when running our large end-to-end -end test, we probably want to hit a real server, um, which, depending on your network connection, can actually be, take a long time. So you probably want to do it on a background thread. At this point, the problem is that Espresso synchronization is not aware of your background task, and your test may become flaky or even permanently fail. So traditionally, this is the place where somebody put a thread sleep in their test code, but with Espresso, it's not required because you can just use uh, and write an idling resource, where an idling resource is a simple interface for you as a developer to implement to teach Espresso synchronization of any of the custom long-running logic of your, uh, of your app. So we made our large end-to-end -end test now more reliable using an idling resource. However, it still takes a very long time to run. So let's see how we can add some medium-sized tests to our test suite. So for our medium-sized tests, we want to keep them small and isolated on a single UI component, where a single UI component could be a specific view, fragment, or an activity. Let's go back to our original example to see how we can dissect it into a smaller, isolated UI component. So in this example, the first thing that you may have noticed is that there's two activities, the node list activity on the left and the add node activity on the right. Until now, we had a large end-to-end -end test that gives us a lot of confidence because it touches a lot of our app code, which is great for a large end-to-end -end test. However, uh, these tests are not so great for a fast iterative TDD cycle because these tests run slow and may increase in maintenance burden because a change in neither of the activity now can make your test actually fail. So let's think how we can break up these dependencies and test each of these activities in isolation. So uh, like when, uh, this will result actually in a smaller, faster running test, which will in turn provide better iterative developer work uh, cycle. So to isolate the first activity on the left, we can actually use Espresso Intense. We can use Espresso Intense to intercept any outgoing intents, verify their content, and provide back a stopped version of activity result. So let's see how it actually looks like in code. The intent stabbing API is actually pretty simple. All you have to do is specify an intent matcher, 
uh, to intercept the outgoing intent and then respond back with a stop version of activity resolve back to the caller. Okay, so let's see how we can use this API. The first line, you do exactly that. We intercept the intent, respond with a stop version of activity resolve. Now on the next line, instead of starting a new activity, Espresso will intercept the intent and reply back with activity resolved. Now, and finally, on the last line, we have to make sure that you know, our UI was updated accordingly. So let's see how we can isolate our second part. Usually, when writing, uh, um, when writing tests, we have some external factors that are in play that are sort of a control. So we want to isolate ourselves from them. So in this example, we hit a real server, and I showed you how to make it more reliable using an idling resource. However, wouldn't it be better if we completely isolate ourselves from them? Because when you hit a real server, you app, your test can still crash because your server can crash for some unpredictable reason and your test will fail. Beyond this specific example, you want to further isolate yourself from any external factors. For example, you don't want to test system UI or any other UI component that you don't own because it's already tested and it can also change without your knowing, which will make your test fail. So let's see how we can isolate our, uh, uh, the second isolated test would look like. The important part here is that we no longer use uh, the real server. We never hit the network. There are many different ways of you to do that uh, yourself, but in this example, we use a hermetic repository, which we can then use in order to make sure that our node was saved without ever relying on the network. And at the same time, we might take, uh, so now if you think about this, now we have two smaller isolated tests that run much faster and are more reliable. And at the same time, we still maintain the same test coverage as we did with our large end-to-end -end test, which is the reason why for TDD, you should end up with more of these medium-sized tests uh, as compared to the large end-to-end -end tests that we showed you in the very, very beginning. So now, uh, now that we iterated through our developer workflow a, a few times, we should see all of our tests start to turn green, and we should be very confident to release our new feature. And with that, we've reached the end of our workflow uh, cycle, and we showed you all the tools that you can use across every step of the way to make TDD possible on Android. Now, with that said, even if you don't follow this exact flow, hopefully you know how to use these tools to write good tests and bring your app quality to the next level. Now, if you're passionate about, about testing and you would like to write tests like we do at Google, here are some resources to get you started. And with that, I want to thank you. And if you have any questions, you can come to ask the speaker zone outside of this room, and we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Thank you.